Good morning, everybody. Why don't you stand to your feet when it gets started with some music? Let's sing together.
glad that you're here. Why don't you take a second, say hi to the folks around you, say hi to somebody new, and then continue to stand. We're going to keep singing.
Welcome to Crossroads. We're so glad that you joined us today, whether you're in the auditorium, the atrium, or watching online. My name is Ann Martinez, and I am the Elementary Children's Ministry Director. My name is Corey Wright, and I work on staff with students here at Crossroads. We just finished our first kids camp of the summer, and it was filled with tons of fun. We've got another one coming up this week for kids ages 1st through 5th grade. You can learn more about that camp online. We also have a packed summer for middle and high school students. If you'd like more information on that, you can check online or in the Student Center on Sunday mornings. We just had our first event, and you won't want to miss them. And if you're a first-time guest, you can fill out the Connect to Crossroads card in your program. If you'd like, you can take it to the Welcome Center and the Atrium and get a special gift. Last, we have baptism services coming up on June 17th and 18th. If you have decided to follow Christ with your life, baptism is an important next step for you. After each service this weekend, there will be a brief orientation meeting in the front of the auditorium. You will get more information and can ask any questions you have there and also register. You can also find more information about baptism online or in the atrium. Again, thank you for joining us today. We're so glad you're here. Well, I also want to add my welcome to Crossroads this morning. I'm so glad all of you are here. Like Ann said in that video, we have kids camp coming up this week for kids entering first through fifth grade. If you have a kid you want to sign up, just show up on the first day of camp, Monday morning, 8.45 a.m., and you can do that. Also, baptism, if, you, if you're a follower of Christ and you haven't been baptized, that's a great next step for you. So again, we have a brief orientation right down front here, right after service. One other thing I wanna point out is we have our next step classes today. We're offering classes 101 through 401, and I wanna extend a special invite to all of you to Crossroads 101, where you'll learn more about the mission and heartbeat of our church. Lunch and childcare are provided free, and if you didn't sign up already, no worries. You can just stop by in the atrium right after second service, uh, and, and a volunteer will be happy to sign you up. Well, our hosts are about ready to come and receive our weekly tithes and offerings. And I want to say a big thank you to all of you who give. Whether you give one dollar or a thousand, every dollar makes a difference and goes towards funding the mission of making Crossroads a welcoming place, a place where people can find hope and be loved. Let's pray together. God, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you that you constantly provide for us, that you never leave or forsake us. We are deeply grateful for what you did through Jesus. That is the best news ever. In Jesus' name, amen.
want to specify? Lieutenant. Sam. Well, I want to welcome you to our new series, The Best News Ever. And uh, what prompted this series is I started thinking about how we're just surrounded by bad news all the time, every day. And in fact, we're surrounded by so much bad news when we hear good news, it almost seems unbelievable or overblown or exaggerated. But there is relief in sight because there is good news. There is good news profoundly good news, and that's what we're focusing on. For the next four weeks, the best news ever. And I'll tell you good news. Good news is what happened last weekend here at our Daring Faith one-year anniversary. Many people signed on for the first time. If you haven't yet, grab a brochure on the way out, read about it, fill out that card, put it in the offering, or mail it in any time during this month. You can be part of that. But what I loved the most last week was what happened outside. After the service, I went outside after every service. There are bouncy houses, kids having fun, there's music playing out there. Uh, adults are playing cornhole and our staff is feeding everybody. It was a great time. Starbucks, South Loveland on Eagle Drive, they gave us all that outdoor patio furniture there. If you ever go in there, say thank you to them. But everybody was just going, wow, this is a great time. And it was wonderful. That's good news that happens around here. And it happens every week. Well, let's jump in. Week one of this series, the best news ever. And I want to begin by uh, pointing out to you in baseball, when a, a pitcher pitches the first pitch of a game and the last pitch of the game, that's called a complete game. One pitcher beginning to end. Nowadays, it hardly ever happens. And some of you know this, from the year 2000 to 2010, and those were the only statistics I could find. The pitch, number of pitchers that pitched a consecutive complete games, consecutive complete games, beginning to the end, consecutive starts, was only four. That's all, for a whole decade. Roy Halladay is from Colorado. He had that record four most consecutive complete games for the entire decade. Now, 100 years ago was a different story. 1900, what do you think the number of consecutive complete games pitched by a pitcher was? Turn to the person next to you, tell them. Remember the first decade of this century, 21st century? The record was four. What do you think it was in the 1900s? 1900 to 1910, consecutive complete games. It's going to be pitched by somebody you never heard of. His name was Jack Taylor. He pitched 187 consecutive complete games. Back in that day when the manager gave the ball to the pitcher, the expectation was you're going to start the game, you're going to finish the game. Nowadays, it's different. Nowadays, we pay pitchers $20 million. Nobody expects them to finish. Not at all. In fact, we've come up with a new statistic for a pitcher not they, All they have to pitch is six innings. Not nine, not eight, not seven. Six innings, give up three earned runs or less. They get credit for what's called a quality start. I mean, doesn't that sound wonderful? Wow, you're a quality start. That's all. All you got to do is give us a quality start. We'll bring in a relief pitcher to relieve you. You don't even have to finish. Imagine if we did that up here. Imagine if we operated like that. I'm giving a sermon, it's not going well. <laughs> Somebody walks up, they go, you know, John, John, you just don't have it today. You know, we're gonna bring in a relief preacher to finish the message. Or what if that's happening some other area of life? You know, say you're married, you're in an argument, things aren't going well. Your wife says, you know what? I'm bringing in a relief husband to finish the day. <laughs> of course, life doesn't work that way. Life is not about quality starts. It's about finishing well. That's what life's about. And did you ever start something and quit? And then later on, you wished you'd have finished it? Do you ever like, you know, you go back to school working on a degree, then it gets hard. It gets hard, so you bail. Or you start taking music lessons, art lessons, or 
You, uh, you start working with a coach to develop some athletic skill you have, but then that gets difficult, so you quit. You know, or you're volunteering somewhere, or you got a new job somewhere. It's getting hard. You're swimming upstream. You just decide, I'm stopping the whole thing. You just give up. Or, or you're trying to do something, trying to get your body in shape. Or you're trying to stick with a budget. But that gets difficult. You just give up. Or, or you got a friend. Things get bumpy in a friendship. Or you're married. Things get difficult. You bail on that. And then later on, you go, man, I wish I would have handled that whole thing differently. I got good news for you today. It's one single thought. One single thought. And when you walk out of here, I want, and if you're watching, listening, I want this thought cemented in all of our minds. And it's this. And it's found at the beginning of the book of Philippians. Chapter 1, book of Philippians. Paul writes this, writes this to this little church in the town of Philippi. And he says, he's so convinced. He's persuaded of this. Here's the verse. Philippians 1.6. It's up on the side screens. It's in the message notes. This is what Paul says. He says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. I want us all to carry this verse with us all week. So why don't we all, let's all say it out loud and think about this as you say this verse. Here we go. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. I'm going to spend the rest of my time going through that one statement Phrase by faith, phrase, that's it. And I think the most important word in that entire sentence was the first word. Notice what it is? The first word was he, he. You could write that down, that's number one. He, Paul doesn't start, he doesn't say, I'm convinced that you who started a good work in you will be faithful to complete it because you didn't start anything. First thing is he, you didn't start yourself. Think about it. You didn't make your body. You didn't design your genes. You didn't create those gifts that you have deep inside of you, those talents. Who did all that? God did it. That's right. God's pitching. God did it. You didn't convict yourself of your sins. You didn't even draw yourself to God. God did all that. And God was up to something when he did. And God's up to something in you. God is. God's pitching. And what does God have? He's got power. Power. How much power? All power. Read the Bible. He's got enough power to create everything that we see. The beautiful mountains, the oceans, the deserts, the valleys, the streams, the entire universe, everything that's in it. That's how much power he has. He had enough power to part the Red Sea so people could walk on dry land. He had enough power to bring water out of a rock so people could drink. He had enough power to turn water into wine at a wedding for a celebration. He had enough power to calm the waters during a storm. And he had enough power to walk on that water when he wanted to get to a boat. He's got all the power that is needed. And in Jesus, he had enough power to come down to earth, take on a human body like yours and mine. And when, he, when they tried to kill him, he had enough power to roll the stone away and raise Jesus from the dead. How much power does God have? All power. That's the best news ever. He's got all the power, all the power that you need. That's how much power he has. If this was another kind of church right now, I think people would be saying something. They'd be going amen or something. That's right. It's all right. Who's pitching? God, that's right, God's pitching. And what does he have? Power. And how much? All the power you need. That's power to change your heart. That's how much power. Power to help you resist temptation. Power to help you speak the truth. and To love a difficult person. He's got enough power to help you overcome an addiction. Enough power to change the heart of a racist. For you to endure suffering. Power... It's got enough power to help you just not to give up. Paul doesn't start with you. Paul starts with he. 
Then the second phrase, he goes on. He who began. He who began, that's number two. Let's say that all together. He who began. Paul doesn't say he who finished already. He doesn't say he who, who started and is working real fast. He doesn't say that. It says he who began. You know what that means? That means you ain't finished yet. That's what that means. He's still working in your life. My life too. We're a work in progress. That means we're a work in progress, all of us. That means you're going to experience problems in this life. It means your heart may get broken. Your world might get shattered. It means you're going to experience some problems. You'll get things wrong. It means you're going to have to be patient sometimes in this life. You're going to have to endure failure. It means you're going to have to wait. And that's hard because we hate to wait. I mean, how do you feel about it waiting? How do you feel about a real long, nice wait? You love that? I hate waiting in line. I do. I, I don't like it. I don't like waiting in line at the bank, at the post office. I don't like it. I don't like waiting at a stoplight. I didn't like waiting for my hot dog Wednesday at the Rockies game. Big line to get the hot dog. Then I see it's got nothing on it. I got to go over and wait at the, to get the relish and the, the mustard. No ketchup on a hot dog, by the way. Uh, got to wait for that. I hate to wait. I hate to pull into a gas station. All the pumps are occupied. I got to wait for somebody to leave. I don't like waiting uh, at a drive through like I did this morning. How good are you at waiting? I think more than any people in the history of the world, we're the worst waiters. We are right now. We're in a hurry. Always in a hurry. We're horn honking, microwaving, FedEx, Amazon Prime, overnight shipping, fast food eating, express lane shopping, hurry. That's what we are. I mean, people hate it. I watch them. They hate it when their little laptop doesn't boot up immediately. Drives people crazy. We don't like to wait. We don't like to wait. But know this. Something's going on when we're waiting. Because he began something in us. God began something in us. Look at Isaiah 40, 31. It says, but those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not get tired. They will walk and not become weary. That means if I can wait on God, if I can wait with patience, if I can wait and keep hoping, wait and not give in to despair, if I can wait and remain faithful to God, if I can wait, God's doing something. God's working inside of me. God's working in my situation. Because here's the secret of waiting. And I certainly don't have this all figured out. But I do know this. What God does when you're waiting is as important as what you're waiting for. That's the truth. Who you become while you're waiting is as important as what you're waiting for. And me too. Because God's at work. Because God's pitching. He's started. He's going to finish. And wait time is never wasted time. Ever. Let's go on. Let's go on with this sentence. He who began what? A good work. That's number three. He who began a good work. And notice that's the only work God does. All the work that God does is good work. This goes all the way back to the uh, first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1. God looks down on all his creation, what he just made, and what does God say? Genesis 1.31. God saw all that he made, and it was very good. It's good. It's all God does is good work. There's a verse in Habakkuk, chapter 3, verse 2. You know where Habakkuk is? Turn to Habakkuk, everybody. Uh, it's in the Old Testament. This is actually a prayer. Habakkuk 3, 2. Lord, the prophet says, Lord, I have heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds, your work. Lord, renew them in our day. In our time, make them known. The prophet is saying here, God, I... I know you've done great things in the past. I'm so glad you did. I heard about your deeds. I heard about your work. I'm so grateful that you created this world that we live in. I'm so grateful that you created human beings. 
And I'm so grateful how you've showed up in the past and you've done your good work. I'm grateful you saved humanity from the flood. I'm grateful you raised up people like David and Esther and, and Ruth and, and Elijah. But now, the prophet says, now, God, would you renew those kinds of works right now in our day? God, now is our time. Would you make that good work known now in our time? That's what we all long for right there. That's what we all long for, God to do his good work right now. Where marriages would be restored. And lives would get put back together now. Cancer would be eradicated, cured. Where justice would roll like waters and Sex trafficking would end. Wouldn't that be something? Fabulous. For all people to live everywhere in this world, to be treated with love and respect and dignity, and for humility to reign in boardrooms and in churches and in Washington, and for the ability to live with a grateful heart, be grateful for what we have in, in the middle of this insane world of consumption, and for the ability to trust God without giving in to worry in the middle of such anxious times and an out of control world and for a community of Jesus followers to be so filled with love and joy and servanthood and generosity that you couldn't keep people away. That's what we long for. And God's done it before and he could do it again. And I wonder who would make this prayer of Habakkuk 3.2. Make this prayer your prayer this week. Lord, I've heard of your fame. I stand in awe of your deeds in the past. Renew them in our day. God, in our time right now, make them known. He who began a good work. Let's go on. Next phrase. Next phrase. The fourth part. He who began a good work in you. In you. Let's repeat that. Everybody together. He who began a good work in you, in you. Gets personal now. It's not just the God who did good work in nature, did good, did good work in the Old Testament times, did good work in Jesus, did good work in Paul. He who began a good work one day in you. This is real important. God began a good work in you. Turn to the person next to you. Say, God's begun a good work in you. Say to that person, you're a real piece of work. Go ahead. It's real important. We are all pieces of work. Think about it. That's important. It's important because any significant area of your life, sooner or later, you're going to face your own inadequacy. You're going to fi figure it out eventually. You know, we don't have it all together. You know, we face the inadequacies. You ever felt inadequate? I remember... Uh, Phyllis and I, we were driving, driving, to, uh, going to Denver, to Buell Theater of all places. And, you know, before we leave, there's a warning light on the dashboard that says, check tires. Phyllis says, hey, before we go, you ought to go into the gas station, check the tires. I said, hey, I looked at them before we left. We got four of them. Let's go. We're ready. We get halfway to Denver, all dressed up. Tire goes flat as a pancake. I'm on the side of I-25, changing the tire. Phyllis looks at me and says, now you know why they call those lights idiot lights. <laughs> There's a guy by the name of Charles Shedd. He's a Christian writer, speaker. He said this one time, before we had kids, I used to travel the country. Before we had kids, giving a talk I called the Ten Commandments for Raising Perfect Children. He says, after he and his wife had their first child, he changed the name of the talk to Ten Hints for Parents. Then after their second child, he retitled the talk, A Few Tentative Suggestions for Fellow Travelers. After their third child, he said he gave up on giving that talk altogether. Do you ever feel inadequate? You ever feel inadequate? I'll tell you why you feel inadequate. It's because you are inadequate, and so am I. Kind of a funny thing. The older I get, and I'm not going to go into details, so don't get excited. But I live with a greater sense of my own inadequacy than ever before. 
But my inadequacy or my adequacy is not the main thing about me. The main thing about me is he has begun a good work in me. God's begun a good work in me. He started it. He's going to finish it. And that's the good news. And God's begun a good work in you. Every person in this room, in the atrium, watching online, God has begun a good work in you. No matter how inadequate you feel at times, no matter how much you foul up, God's already done this. He's begun that work in your life. And if you've never turned your life over to Jesus, he's waiting for you to do that. So he can finish that work in, his, in your life. And if you haven't done that, you can do it now. You just, you just in your heart, you say, God, you're the one that made me. You started this work in my life. I wouldn't even be here without you. And I feel so inadequate at times. And you know how I have struggles with my temptations and my shortcomings. Would you forgive me through what Jesus did on the cross? Would you forgive me for all of that? And when the, the hope that is found in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God, would you make that the hope of my life? You can pray that prayer. God will begin that good work in your life right now and carry it on. And if you haven't been baptized, you prayed that prayer today or at another time in your life, get baptized, get it done this year, and celebrate the good work that God is doing in your life. Let's go on. Fifth part of this, this sentence right here. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. He'll be faithful to complete it. He began a good work in you. God's the starter. He's going to be the finisher. He's going to complete this work in you. We just sang the song. Great is your faithfulness. Your faithfulness, oh God. In the Old Testament times, people never got tired of praising God for his faithfulness. In fact, Moses' last words to the Israel, people of Israel, last words, this is what he wanted them to remember, Deuteronomy 7, 9. He wanted them to remember, know therefore that the Lord your God is God. He is faith, he's a faithful God. Keeping his covenant of love. Keeping his promise of love to a thousand generations. Psalm 34, 33, 4. Let's read this out loud together. Let's read. For the word of the Lord is right and true. And think about this. He is faithful in all he does. Circle the word all. That word all right there, that's the mind blower. God is faithful in all he does. We're not that way, we human beings. None of us are faithful in all that we do. We're not. It's not the human condition. If I ask you how many of you, you know a husband that quit on a wife or a wife quit on a husband, we all know that. Or how many parents, parents actually, sometimes quitting on their kid. Kid messes up and they just, just disregard him, quit on him. Or young people that quit on their parents, just start doing the blame game with their parents and quit on them. Or how many of you know, of you know a friend, friendship? Had a friend, relationship got bumpy, then the friend just quit on the whole deal. Happens more and more and more these days. God doesn't quit. God starts stuff. God started the world. God started humanity. God started your life. God doesn't quit. When Jesus starts working in your life, he'll complete what he started. In spite of hurts, habits, hang-ups, bad decisions, my sins, in spite of all the circumstances I face, God is going to finish what God started in my life. And in your life too. You're going to make it because of that. You're going to make it because of that. And this, on a personal note, this is very important to me because sometimes I regress. Sometimes I revert back and say, do things that, that still that I know break the heart of God. And when that happens, I could just imagine. I, I just think, first thought in my head, I'll think, that's got to be the deal breaker. That's got to be the straw that broke the camel's back. I picture God saying, Smith, I'm so done with you. I'm so done with trying to transform your life. And then this verse comes to my mind, this verse that we're reading. And I go, no, no. 
God who committed himself to good work in my life. God's never going to quit. Never going to quit, even when I regress. God keeps the work gloves on. God keeps the tool belt on and keeps the blueprint out. And God says, I see your regression. And that grieves me. God says, I'm not going to quit on you, John. I'm not going to quit on you. Let's pick it up from here and let's rebuild. We start stuff. We don't finish. We begin. We get discouraged. We quit. God doesn't. God's faithful. God is faithful in all, all he does. And it brings us right to the end. This is the whole deal now of this passage. We'll put it up. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. Let's read it one more time all together. The full deal, full passage. Here we go. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. And what's the day of Christ Jesus? Is that the day you die? No, it's not the day you die. That's the day Jesus returns. It's the day he comes back. And he will resurrect and redeem and fix all the brokenness and darkness of this messed up world that we live in. That's, that's when his work will be completed, including completed in you. It's not the day you die. Because your life, our lives are about something much, much bigger. It didn't begin on the day you were born. It's not going to end on the day you die. No, that's not when your game started. That's not when your game ends. It ends when Jesus comes back. Because Jesus is in the bullpen. And he's warmed up. And he's the starter. He's the closer. He's the first. He's the last. He's the alpha. He's the omega. He's the author of our faith. The protector of our faith. He came to earth one day. And he's coming back one day. That's the good news right there. Best news ever. It is. And if you think God's going to quit on, and now you think God's going to quit on your life, don't ever think that. You think God would ever quit on you, you're out of your mind. So whatever you do, don't quit on God. Don't quit on God. Don't quit. Maybe you prayed for somebody. You didn't get an answer. You just quit praying about it or about something. I talked to somebody a couple weeks ago. They told me about how they had prayed for a loved one for years, nothing ever happened. That they'd opened their heart to God. Nothing happened. They said they quit praying. Now, years later, they find out the person is opening their heart to God on their own, reading Psalms, and is open to the things of God. Whatever you're praying about, don't quit. Don't quit. You're a parent. Maybe you don't know what to do. Maybe you're Maybe your son or daughter is doing things that are killing you. You're going to resign? You're going to withdraw from them? You're going to quit? Will you hang in? Will you hang in? Will you keep loving? Will you keep praying for them? Will you keep trying to be the best you know how as a parent? Maybe you're at a spiritual quitting point. Maybe you've tried to walk with God, but it's getting harder and harder. Harder and harder. Maybe you got some habit around money or anger, or some addiction, and you're, you get discouraged. You know, you can quit. You can quit anytime you want. You can. But how often do you look back on your life? You glad, you're glad you quit something. And let me ask this. When did quitting ever build someone's character or prepare them for future problems? Maybe you're at your quitting point of taking care of the body that God has given you, ready to just give it up, or quitting sharing your faith with somebody, a friend, or, or taking me up on the challenge to invite one person a week here. Maybe God's called you to work with a, a group of people, and it's getting hard. Maybe you're in education, working with young people, some area, and they're resisting you. Don't quit. Don't quit. Or maybe God's called you to help eradicate the poverty problem in our community, and in this world. Maybe it's so overwhelming, you just want to throw in the towel. Or maybe, maybe you wrestle with a level of anxiety or depression so deep, you want to quit on life. 
Don't do it. Don't do it. Not now. Not now. Why? Let's put the verse up again. Here's why we don't quit. It's because he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it on the day of Christ Jesus. Let's bow our heads together. Would you bow your head? Would you even close your eyes? And here's what I think right now. I think what the Spirit of God would want to do in this room, in this moment, is, is to encourage a lot of people that are here. And so let God just whisper to you right now. And I think God would say to you, you're my beloved son. You're my, you're my prized daughter. And I began a good work in you. And whatever is weighing you down, whatever is burdening, burdening you, it's not going to get the last word. I know about what you're going through. I know about the struggles. I know about the, the pain and the hurt. I know about your, your regrets, your mistakes. And I've begun to work in you. My daughter, my son, I'm faithful. And it's not in my heart to give up on you. That life I placed in you is there, and it's growing. And I will carry it through. Now, God, would you breathe, breathe your encouragement and your life on me and my sisters and brothers here. We're staking everything, God. We're placing all our hopes. We're entrusting our hearts and our eternities to you. And God, I thank you that you are faithful in all you do. In Jesus' name, amen.
I want to invite all of you, if you haven't been baptized, go ahead, meet with Pastor Dennis Anderson down here in the front for a brief orientation. Also, uh, I want to challenge you, if you know someone, I think we all do, who needs to hear good news, invite them next week. They'll hear something very uplifting from John. Thanks for being here, everybody. God bless. See you next week.